panel. So it's my absolute utter pleasure to be sitting up here with three fantastic panelists who have very differing backgrounds. Um, originally, when you first heard of this event, you may have seen the name Sam Sachs also included. Unfortunately, as a result of coronavirus, she's been unable to travel with us. But we're really impressed by the incredible ecosystem that we have here out in Silicon Valley because we had two additional members step up very quickly. And uh, as a result, I think we're going to have a very, very interesting chat this evening. It's my utter pleasure to introduce directly to my left, Schumann, the global head of artificial intelligence for F5 Networks. He's done many, many things, but most notably did his undergrad at a university in Canada called Western University. I studied at one called Queens. That's significant if you're Canadian. And that made me very excited when I uh, met up with him here. But beyond uh, his undergrad, he's done a high number of things, including studying at MIT, as well as being the leading global project management for click fraud at Google, and starting and founding the original Privacy Council at Google, which has a lot of significance to our conversations tonight. He also was the chief technology officer for Shape Security prior to its acquisition by F5, where he now leads, of course, uh, their, is their global head of AI. So we're very excited to have him on board. Um, in the middle, we have Graham Webster. Uh, Graham's work through a publication called DigiChina, which is affiliated with both Stanford and New America, uh, was incredibly instrumental to the work, some of the research that I did in grad school and the research that I continue to do. It's fantastic. I highly recommend you check it out. It's an interorganizational network of specialists that produce analysis and translate China's digital policy developments. Um, and at the end, um, Furthest from me, but no, fur no further from the conversation than anybody else, uh, we have Zian Ziang, the head of digital trade for the World Economic Forum, uh, an attorney, a policymaker, and an expert in a phenomenally long list of exciting things, such as digital trade, e-commerce, cross-border data flows, the sharing economy, and tech trade. Lots of significance to tonight's conversation. Um, He's held a number of former positions, including as senior legal counsel of Airbnb and is fluent in Chinese. Tonight, how we're running this panel session, for the first 40 minutes, we'll be covering three major topics. We'll be looking at data governance as sort of a policy theory, defining what that means, and providing some commentary for its significance today. We'll also then delve a little bit more into the legal implications of what these laws actually mean. And finally, um, look at questions around both the balance between security and privacy, as well as technically what creating products that comply with these evolving data policies looks like and how that, um, what that means for business. And then naturally we'll open it up to the floor. But to kick us all off, I'm gonna ask each one of the panelists to answer the question, is data the new oil? <laughs> Schumann, would you like to kick us off and we'll go down in, in this order? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want us to elaborate. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, the entire world runs on data in one form or another at this point, and so it has become uh, the most essential commodity in terms of the information age. Graham? Well, I'm going to disagree. I, I think um, data isn't the new oil uh, fundamentally because unlike oil, which does come in a few different varieties, uh, ultimately oil becomes uh, refined and is essentially a fungible resource uh, and becomes energy, which is a sort of basic flexible res resource, whereas data is very specific. Um, the source, categories, context, uh, noisiness of, of data um, add a bunch of different uh, characteristics to it, and so it's basically, uh, you know, it's both easier to get because you don't have to dig up uh, undersea uh, oil stores, um, but it's also harder to figure out what's the good stuff. So I think the the, the comparison uh, can be a little strained, but take the point. Um, this phrase always gets under my skin, so <laughs> the answer is no. And I'll say data is actually the new air. So unlike oil, um, there's a finite amount. So air, there's infinite, or well, relatively speaking, infinite <laughs> amount of oil. And air is also like data, is, uh, I mean, um, data is also like air, a catalyst, right? If you burn fire, you need oxygen, and uh, data is a catalyst to uh, uh, many innovations. And lastly, um, if you're in a stuffy room, what do you do? You open air and let the air flow. 
I think you know we also need、uh, data to flow as well. Marvelous. So let's let's focus in and start to set the stage on data governance and what we mean by that. So Graham,、um, I'd love to start with you if you could introduce to our group today how you understand data governance as a landscape and various models、um, and variations in those models of data governance. What does it mean? Thanks. So.、Um Data governance is a very broad、uh, concept. It's, it's going to mean a lot of different things、um, in different contexts. But I think it's useful to think about、um, data. Ultimately, is tabulated, you know, compiled information about some、uh, type of context, and access to that data or the way that it is、uh, shared or leveraged has to do with power in our societies and economies. Uh, or in international security, or in or in the the privacy of your own life,、um, and governance is、uh, a category of thought and activity that deals with the distribution of power and the legitimate use of power. So, who are the big actors in the meeting of that?、Uh, you know, the power in information and the governance function. I think the obvious one is、uh, nation states and governments.、Um, obviously, governments have、uh, rules about how various information、uh, flows around.、Um, if you're the government of China, there's a heck of a lot of regulation about、uh, what news can be transmitted. If you're、uh, the European Union,、uh, privacy is is、uh, now heavily enshrined in the、uh, GDPR,、um, but In the everyday experience of our kind of digital economy and and the way that we encounter data, kind of interminably, if you're like me and you carry these things around constantly,、um, you're actually encountering data governance that is、uh, executed and come up with by companies. And so,、uh, you know, the way that Apple has engineered the iPad and the, and the software that runs it、uh, governs the type of data that is collected. And may be transmitted to the various services that I use.、Um, I have email accounts with both Google and Microsoft. Well, they're dealing with my data in different ways, and they're tracking different things, and they have different rules. Those governors, whether it's states or companies,、uh, interact with one another. They interact with、uh, individuals in the marketplace and, and citizens around the world.、Um, and to me, the key of、uh, data governance is that power relationship between.、Uh, Individuals, companies, governments, and other interests. So that's you know, basically how I look at it. And to build on that,、um, earlier we discussed three reasons from your perspective as to why data governance is particularly important today in 2020. So I'd love it if you could share with the group、uh, some of these reasons as you as you have observed as to why we're even having a discussion like this today. Yeah. Well, I come at this. As you mentioned, from、uh, the study of China and China's technology,、uh, you know, policy and development, and I also come at it、uh, after years of basically having my career focused on U.S.-China relations,、um, and I find that the questions about data and power, both in Chinese society and across U.S.-China relations,、um, have a tendency to interact with three things that.、Uh, Have people really freaked out right now?、Um, the first is just automation and data-driven technologies, what we often call AI,、um, are data-intensive, and they're affecting our lives. They're affecting our public sphere. They're affecting our social relationships with one another.、Um, and frankly, I don't think any society or any country has any idea seriously what to do about this yet.、Uh, the power relationships among people and companies and all that—that's just not worked out.、Um, And that makes us nervous.、Um, the second thing is、uh, there's a national kind of crisis of confidence. I think in this country, coming out of、uh, maybe the financial crisis I mean, in the last ten years, you could say、uh, the the end of the high that came after the fall of the Soviet Union and and the kind of end of history idea, which is I guess a little bit cartoonized, but. You know, take the cartoonized version that said that the end of the Cold War was the end of history, and、uh, essentially liberal democracy. The Americans primarily had won. Well, it looks like the power relations around the world
are a little different than that. And maybe the Americans never had as much power as some, especially in Washington, thought they did. So there's this reckoning there about a loss of power. And then within societies, there's uh, another outcome from automation, which is uh, the restructuring of uh, labor and, and uh, the future of work. If you're uh, driving a truck today, that's a pretty good draw, job. Long, long haul trucking is, is pretty well paying. You spend a lot of time away from home, but you can invest and, and live a pretty good life. If uh, various companies succeed in developing autonomous vehicles and if they start driving those long haul trucks, those people are out of a job. All of these things to me, uh, the three of them, you know, what's happening to our society, what's happening to U.S. status in the world, and uh, the problem of jobs, basically, um, are wrapped up in data and new technologies, and they're also wrapped up for Americans in nervousness about China. So I like to kind of think of things in that uh, structure because it shows us that a lot of the things that we're nervous about about technology are actually just, uh, well, not just, but they are embodied in broader uh, nerves that are flowing through a lot of societies. And a lot of the things that we're nervous about China also are about our own nerves about in various societies. So it's not to say that the data problems or the China problems are not real, but it is to say that we should try to keep straight uh, what we're blaming who for. You know, if it's if if the Chinese military is developing a strong data-driven capability that can take down an American uh, 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 aircraft carrier, that's serious concern for military planners in this country. Um, but, you know, if a Chinese company is developing a consumer application that serves ads to Chinese consumers better, this is not much of a concern to me. So, Interesting. Okay, switching gears a bit. Um, Ziyang, could you walk us through a little bit more about what we're talking about when we're discussing data? What, what do we mean when we say data flowing? What are the types of data flows? What are limitations of data flows at this point? Um, I think it would be helpful to color the conversation with a little bit more nuance as to what this really looks like. Happy to. Uh, before I start, I actually want to give a shout out for Asia Society to starting the uh, Tech Diplomacy Program, right? It just, I'm actually reading this book called the Silicon States right now. It's basically arguing that Silicon Valley companies should be treated as countries, you know, because the number of users and their GDPs and their influence on uh, global geopolitical issues. So kudos to you <laughs> for doing that. Um, and then back to you. Um, Today's discussion, thanks for the question. I think when we talk about data governance in the international space, uh, it's hard to not talk about uh, data flows. Uh, otherwise, it's more a um, domestic region, domestic issue. Um, so I think i like to, oh, excuse me, uh, discussing just in a couple um, areas. One, two, uh, briefly talk about what are we talking about when we talk about data flows? What are the types of data? Uh, two, what are some um, limitations and why? countries or regions put limitations on data flows. Um, three, talk about some of the um, um, why data flow is good, is, you know, the positive reasons for argument for data flows, and maybe close with some uh, uh, suggestions, recommendations. So I'll try to be uh, brief, and because I understand I have a lot of topics to cover. Um, so when we talk about data flows, a lot of, I think, you know, immediately people think about personal data, right? Uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, definitely has brought the issue to the uh, public. But when we talk about cross-border data flows, actually, uh, the majority are, um, if, if not, you know, number-wise, a lot of the data is, um, is not just personal data. For example, manufacturing data. That's tons of data crossing borders from companies uh, uh, to companies, or within companies, within a multinational. Or, for example, I have a project at Thang, uh, 3D printing. So when you are sending the CAD file, the 3D printing file from one country to another, that's also data flows, right? So manufacturing data. Within a company, there's a lot of just company data, you know, HR data, et cetera, those, those data. Um, 
uh, maintenance data. Uh, for example, if you have oil well in, let's just say, Central Asia and your company is based in the U.S., you need to get the data of the oil well, right? So you need to know, where am I going to maintain that? You know, is the, are the parts breaking down? You want to do pre, uh, preventive maintenance. Or basic example that touched on us, if you drive a, say, if you drive a German-made car in the U.S., the German car manufacturers probably will need that data or you know, back, send back to the HQ so they can do the analysis and, and, uh, uh, and the maintenance. So that's also data flows. So my point is that it's not just your you know, personal data, your social media data. It actually touches on every aspect. It's not just digital company. I think that's the takeaway. It's not just digital companies should worry about data flows. It's all companies should worry about uh, cross-border data flows. Um, then we touch on, uh, I'd like to discuss why um, there are some concerns uh, in the recent years that has been the overall trend on limitations on data flows, uh, both in individual countries as well as in uh, uh, regional uh, bodies. Uh, there are different reasons for that. Some are very legit. Some are, let's just say, <laughs> Uh, um, more questionable. Um, the reasons could, value, uh, could range from uh, valid legal reasons to uh, cultural reasons. You know, different societies view privacy differently. Um, economical reasons. Some countries um, think that by having the, keeping the data local would create, say, more jobs, um, more data centers, uh, which has actually been debunked, debunked. Maybe that will lead to initial jobs in construction jobs, but uh, I don't know how many of you have been to a data center. They actually employ very few people compared to its size. So, um, or they think that by keeping data in, inside a country domestically, it will help with the domestic innovation, you know, ecosystem, create their own Silicon Valley, that type of uh, uh, thinking. Um, and then there's also the political uh, situations uh, that range everything from sovereignty, data sovereignty, that's been a popular theme recently, uh, to, um, you know, I'll be frank, protectionism. It's digital protectionism. So those are the various reasons, again, from um, uh, um, over the spectrum why countries have uh, data flow restrictions. And when we talk about in manifestation, what they look like, I'll say on one end, you know, um, this is high level um, uh, summary that on one end we have no data flow, free flow of data. Then we have conditional data flow. Uh, for example, um, the GDPR, that could be an example of conditional data flow. Then we have uh, local um, storage requirement. Um, Vietnam passed a law in, I think, in 2015 on the cybersecurity law, uh, 2018 cybersecurity law is an example of that. And then data processing requirements. And then uh, on the far end will be ban on uh, data flows. So, um, oh, Next, I'll quickly talk about what are the benefits, why we need data flows. Um, it's, it's intuitive, but also I think I'd like to give just a couple quick examples. Um, one, fraud detection in payments. Right? That's actually a lot of countries require financial data to be stored in, uh, locally, which there are some legitimate reasons. But if you're an international, say, a criminal ring that uh, targeted, you're based in, um, uh, say, uh, Europe, but you're targeting the SMEs in uh, Latin America, but the data processing units in the U.S., if you don't share data, they can actually take advantage of those gaps. Right. Um, so uh, fraud prevention in the financial services example. Um, uh, smart farming. Uh, what I mean by that is if the, or um, nowadays with, with, a, with AI uh, to aggregate data that can help, you know, there are ways to lead to better yield, for example, in farming. But for smaller countries, if you just have the data of your country, that's often not enough. If you're a country like the United States, yeah. That's big enough, but if for a smaller country in many uh, parts of the world, you need your neighboring country's data to help you to analyze the climates, to uh, the weather and the yields, to um, really make that uh, analysis uh, effective. And for that, you need, again, sharing um, uh, of the data. Um, disaster recovery, they're talking about uh, 
we're in coronavirus right now. We can go into uh, later, but uh, idea of a data uh, trust in case of emergency, break the glass box and share data in, in some certain uh, with with certain restrictions. Um, maybe that's another um, reason. Um, I'll just end quickly by sharing some proposed uh, solutions. Uh, trade agreements has been um, an effective way, especially the newer trade agreements that would include uh, free flow of data as one of the provisions. Uh, the um, USMCA, the uh, new DEPA, which is the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement among New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile is another good example. So I think that's a uh, um, um, good Trade agreements com combined with good regulatory practices, because otherwise trade agreements often have exceptions and exceptions swallows the whole. Uh, the whole. Um, have good international standards, uh, good governance practice, interoperability uh, within the region, that's uh, very uh, important. And lastly, some of the, uh, so hopefully some of the new technologies, I think Shuma mentioned uh, uh, federated data, right? The learning model, maybe that could be a solution for uh, data flows uh, as well. So I'll stop here. Awesome. Um, pulling on a thread of something that you mentioned in fraud and how uh, sharing data is important in fraud, Schumann, I'm wondering if you can comment from your experience when you're leading the team for fraud prevention at Google as to how you view the importance that data plays in uh, addressing and protecting information from fraud. Sure. And um to begin with, I'd like to uh, offer some perspective on the question you asked before about why are we all here and why is this an interesting topic? I think it's because we adopt technology as societies uh, before fully understanding how those technologies can have unintended consequences. And we can share a great deal of data because of the fact that we get benefit from a service that's being offered, often free services, particularly uh, through the internet. And it's only years later that we realize what the implications are of that data having been shared. Sometimes it's explicitly shared in the form of personal information and photographs and videos that we upload. Uh, in other cases, it's implicitly collected. We had no idea that that data was being stockpiled uh, uh, while we were using the service. And, you know, sometimes it's uh, data that we care about, sometimes it's data that we might not care about, but maybe we end up thinking differently about it in a completely different light in the future. So, for example, you think about uh, photographs that you would upload to uh, a photo sharing site. And we don't have to uh, identify any individual site because this principle applies to any public site where you would share photos. You might be using that particular service and you might feel comfortable with the controls that are in place on that service for the data that you're sharing with it. But if that data now gets accessed by individuals or groups who shouldn't have access to it because of a security breach, for example, or because of fraud or abuse, then in that case, all of a sudden, the relationship that you previously had with that platform now changes. Even though you were comfortable with that platform's policies, now you're no longer comfortable with the idea of sharing data with that platform and using that platform in the same way anymore. And so these are the sorts of things that we only discover after we learn about those edge cases where security becomes an issue, where fraud and abuse become issues. And that's often uh, the sort of scenario where we start thinking about the use of data to be able to protect us differently. So. As soon as somebody has had a bad experience with a data breach, for example, that's when they start thinking about how do I make sure that platforms have the resources that they need and sometimes the data that they need to be able to protect me. So I think that uh, uh, a great example of this is uh, we all have uh, very important information that we've put into online platforms like our banks, like uh, social networks that uh, are only sharing pictures and videos uh, with our loved ones and with friends. But raise your hand if you have never reused a password across multiple websites. <laughs> The problem is that cyber criminals have access to the credentials that let them walk through those security controls, and that dramatically changes the way that we think about data and privacy. And these are secondary effects, and we're learning about this more and more as a society, and that complicates the way that we think about issues like privacy as well. So 
In terms of fraud and abuse specifically, the credential example is a great one because when we go to a website and we set up a username and a password, we think that that website is doing everything that it's supposed to do from a security perspective. And the interesting thing is that most of those websites would agree. <laughs> they, they, they would say that this is the security control that we've put in place. We are only going to grant access to that bank account or to that social network if someone presents the correct username and password. And it never occurs to them that because of rampant password reuse, now all of a sudden, third parties can access that exact same data. And so I think that uh, this is a very complicated type of model, and it's beyond the ability for most people to spend the time to understand. I I'm sure that most people would be able to understand all of these issues if it was their job. But you know, th this is why we have folks like uh, Graham and uh, Ziang who can specialize in this to really be able to understand uh, what the policies should be. And then it's folks on my teams and you know, in uh, the tech industry that have to figure out how to be able to create technologies that are going to implement uh, policies. And one of the things that's really difficult right now is that there are clashing policies. So there are disagreements between governments, disagreements between societies in terms of how they regard privacy, how they regard uh, what uh, laws should look like. And usually what that means for tech companies is that you try and come up with something which is going to work for your organization and for your end users. And so it's something as simple as possible, which can often be the lowest common denominator. So if you've got one part of the world that says we're going to uh, create new legislation that is extremely restrictive from a data privacy perspective, you know, just hypothetically, if that happened, Regen. <laughs> then um, the easiest thing to do would be to make that a global policy rather than try to figure out how to be able to implement different versions of your platform in every single jurisdiction. Actually, um on the notion of this potential hypothetical policy, Xiang, it might be helpful if you could point out a couple of the key features of uh, major, major legislation such as the GDPR uh, for the group in case there's people in the crowd who aren't familiar with its beautiful nuances. <laughs> sure, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy to. Um, I don't want to turn this into a GDPR lecture because that would be a five hour slam. So, um, and also two years too late. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just quickly uh, cover. Yeah, I think I'll maybe cover GDPR and uh, also closer to home CCPA. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, so, uh, GDPR, uh, General uh, Data Protection Regulation, came out May 25th, 2018. So, um, if you think of that, just. In the simplest form, it just protects consumers, give consumers like you and me more control over our data. That's really in a, in a nutshell, uh, the right. So we as consumers, uh, we, if you're a EU resident in that case, would have access, uh, right to access your data and also to delete your uh, data. Um, the right of, uh, uh, the right to forgotten, uh, Google has a, <laughs> some tussle over that uh, article, that's uh, uh, enshrining article uh, 17. So that's an example. Um, that would be, there are strict uh, uh, penalties uh, for companies that fail to comply. So for the past two years, you probably, if you're a company, you are busy complying, you're, if you're a consumer, you would get a lot of those uh, uh, opt-in boxes uh, when you visit websites. Uh, so um, th that's, um, yeah, that's GDPR. Um, and since then, I actually looked it up uh, just last night, just to be more recent. I think look at some of the heavy, uh, bigger fines. So I think the bigger thing about GDPR is like, okay, the law is out. Does it have teeth? And that's the biggest question people wonder when it came, uh, first came out. Um, the, the summary is that um, if you ask the, uh, the DPAs, they will say they're just getting started. But some examples, uh, big fines. Google was fined 50 mil. Uh, Marriott, a uh, 99 million. I think British Airway, if I'm right, 187 mil. Uh, those, uh, those are the uh, some of the big fines that were um, uh, handed out. Of course, um, there are also some criticisms about GDPR. Um, the compliance cost for big companies, yeah, they, the compliance cost for, for big companies, they can have. Um, mm, divisions and, you know, group of lawyers to deal with it. But for SMEs, that's a challenge. Um, 
and also could be a bit complicated for the uh, consumers. And then um, closer to home, that's the CCPA, that's the um, uh, California Consumer Protection uh, Act, um, went effective January 1 of this year, so about two, three um, months so old. Yeah, yeah. So now as California residents, we have the right to uh, um, demand a copy of our data, and then we have the right to ask for deletion of that data if we choose to. I think the biggest difference... Um, sorry, just... Um, Make sure I get it right. Uh, the biggest difference is GDPR is opt in, right? And whereas uh, um, CCPA is opt out. So there, there is actually I do think there's a big difference uh, um, 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 among the two. So yep. great, thank you. Um, Another thing that's been mentioned uh, is conflicting data policies. And so I'm curious if anyone on the panel, maybe Graham, has anything to say about regions that have uh, di differences in either how they uh, produce and enforce data-related policies or currently um, data policies that are existing. Yeah, so I, I might, others might have other things to say, but I'll actually note it similarity uh, from the perspective of someone who's studied the Chinese uh, emerging personal data regime, um, which is that, uh, you know, the, the short version of the story is that around uh, 2014, the Chinese government uh, got to work trying to set up a more comprehensive set of laws and regulations around uh, the digital economy and cybersecurity in general. Um, this resulted in uh, the establishment of the Cyberspace Administration of China and, and uh, the cybersecurity law that went into effect in 2017. Um, and these, uh, the agency and the law and all, all the related documents touch on a bunch of things, but one of them is personal information protection. Um, and the marquee document in the Chinese system right now on personal information protection is... Uh, something called the Personal Information Security Specification, which has an unfortunate English acronym, but it's uh, an important document. And it's, this is a long, detailed, non-binding, but sort of binding document that is presented by policymakers as a way to successfully comply with existing rules under the cybersecurity law for personal information protection. And it does a lot of things that GDPR does. So, um, and there's no mystery about how this happened. The Chinese experts, the legal experts and the professors and officials who sat down and wrote this specification, which is a national standard issued by the IT Standards Group, um, they studied the GDPR uh, process. They studied different approaches uh, in different jurisdictions. Uh, and it was sort of an explicit effort to be a little bit interoperable, to, to address some of the pain that companies experience, as, as Schumann described, when you have uh, a bunch of really different um, data governance structures, and you, if you have to comply with a bunch of them and they're really different, that, that hurts more. They tried to be a little more compatible, and that's, I think, for two reasons. One is... Uh, I think, honestly, some of these scholars thought that what the Europeans were up to was uh, a kind of a best practice, um, that the Europeans had done a good job on this. Uh, the process going into GDPR, I don't remember, but it went on for like a decade or something. Um, you know, and so people worked really hard, and, and that was good work, um, looking at the equities of uh, companies and individuals. And the other thing is, um, Chinese companies want to be able to do business abroad with the least amount of reorganizing themselves. Um, so if they have to comply rather assiduously, you know, enforcement of Chinese law is always a question. And there's wiggle room, but this stuff does happen, and, and, and companies are named and shamed for violations of this set of rules. Uh, you know, if, if Alibaba and Tencent and, and ByteDance and everybody are used to following the Chinese system, um, it will be less painful for them uh, to adjust to the European system. They're going to have to adjust, and the Chinese companies are finding that, uh, in general, they're going to need to set up different uh, data centers abroad uh, to address uh, foreign concerns about Chinese government gaining access to user data and to other data about society. Um, you know, but if it's a pretty similar system, then it works out for people. Um, I think where we're going to get into trouble is the CCPA, the, you know, the, the California uh, 
approach. This is just one state. Of course, we're a really important state. But, um, you know, we're one state out of 50 in the United States. There's no uh, real hope, from what I understand, of a national U.S. privacy regime that would displace it. And there's a pretty good likelihood that various other states are going to get in this game. And there's going to be, never mind going from Europe to China to the United States, we're going to have California and, I'm making it up, but Pennsylvania and, you know, Michigan and who cares, right? And what a pain in the butt. Um, so I think the difference, and, and then it, go internationally, and I, I haven't studied this closely, but I, I mean, I know India is working hard on various privacy rules. Um, many countries in Africa are. Um, there are people who are following the GDPR um, example. Uh, there are people who are following the Chinese example. Japan is trying to chart its own way. Um, you know, there could be a profusion of different uh, data governance systems that make life really difficult for companies and engineers and probably also make it harder to protect the legitimate interests of all the people who are supposed to be protected by this, whether it's for cybersecurity or personal privacy. All right, so Schumann, as someone who makes a lot of decisions at a company uh, and deals with these things, it would be helpful if you could walk us through what technically companies may need to think about reorganizations they may have had to do, or even new technologies or research advancements that they may be looking at or investing into in order to be compliant with these various data regimes? Sure. So um, let's suppose that data is the new oil. All right. <laughs> let, let, let's just say that uh, <laughs> that's, that's a metaphor. And um, you had to produce automobiles in a way which was different for every single country as a result. So you had to have a different assembly line for every single country in the world as opposed to having a uh, consolidated uh, set of uh, uh, requirements that could go into individual plants. That would be devastating for the automobile industry. It would make things a lot more expensive, a lot more complex, and maybe it would lead to technological innovations that would allow them to be able to create customizations within the same plant in a way that isn't as easy right now. But there isn't a clear answer for how you would do that in terms of if you actually had to have fundamentally different cars in every single part of the world. So when it comes to making these sorts of decisions with data regimes that are contradictory towards one another or are just requiring you to implement different types of product functionality, you have to try and see what the commonality is between different feature sets and try and simplify the problem as much as possible. So often what that means is if there are a number of variations in terms of how you have to deal with certain types of data, wouldn't it be a lot easier if you just didn't have to deal with that type of data at all? So data reduction, that's one way of being able to do it. And so that can solve other problems at the same time. And this is one of the things that we focused on at Google um, when uh, we were working on uh, privacy in the uh, uh, mid to late uh, 2000s. And uh, that was when we started anonymizing IP addresses in terms of throwing away the last octet of IPs in order to be able to make what is stored at rest over a longer time period uh, more anonymized. You also want to try and figure out what are the internal processes by which that data can be used and who has access to it. And that allows you to be able to get some more control over what could happen in terms of unintended consequences of uh, data suddenly being built into products in ways that uh, you didn't have visibility into. But then ultimately, what you're trying to create is something that is not only going to answer the questions that you're facing today, but represent a way of developing your products that's going to work in the future. Because as Graham was saying, if we've got one CCPA right now, but we're about to have additional state laws that could in some cases be similar, but in other cases be different, then you don't want to design a system right now that encompasses CCPA and GDPR, but then is totally brittle and has to be redesigned as soon as there's a new set of privacy restrictions or legislation uh, in another jurisdiction. And so this is a very complex problem in terms of organizational design, in terms of product design, and it's something that uh, uh, creates opportunities 
for companies to be able to use new technologies in, in ways to be able to solve problems that uh, don't exist in the marketplace right now. So we, we were talking about federated learning, for example. And if you can have uh, reduction of data in disparate locations and actually derive value from those disparate data sources in a way that allows you to be able to protect uh, the uh, privacy of, of that data at the same time, that's an incredibly powerful concept. If, if you use technologies like homomorphic encryption, for example, and uh, you've got many of the benefits of being able to encrypt data, but you've also got the opportunity to be able to ask certain questions of that data so that you can derive value from it, again, in a way that protects data privacy. That can be very powerful. And when we're talking about new technologies, it's very difficult for every single organization to figure this out on their own, especially if you're talking about fundamental research in some cases. And so that creates an opportunity for startups to be able to specialize, figure out how to be able to operationalize a new technology, and then deliver that as a service to everyone so that uh, the entire marketplace can benefit. So I think that these are some of the dynamics which are created as a result of these questions being asked and as a result of uh, new legislation uh, being enacted. Oh, fantastic. So in, um, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up our portion where I'm asking the questions and we'll open it up to the crowd shortly. But before we do that, um, I have one big question for everybody left on the panel, and then we'll see if we have time for a little rapid fire session. So the big question um, for each of you is, uh, as it was discussed at the beginning, coronavirus is uh, a challenge that's being faced in all jurisdictions around the world at this point. From your perspective, what are the implications from a privacy or a data policy angle when it relates to a pandemic like coronavirus or a, a virus like this? Ziang, do you want to kick us off? Um, I think we'll, we'll be seeing the tension right, between the um, Collecting mass amount of data, could that be helpful to, for tracking, you know, for the control of the uh, virus situation, on the other hand, versus individual privacies? Um, just this week, I had a conversation with a lawyer friend uh, based in Italy, in northern Italy, where um, there are um, coronavirus situations. And um, he was telling me, under the GDPR, it's not clear at all, right? If a company, uh, if your company, if your employees do some companies are collecting their temperature, employee temperature data. Uh, and if you, or say, if you have an employee that has coronavirus, right, do you let people know, your company know, do you let other folks know, right? So you can almost have like a, on one hand, like a health um, obligation to do that, all right? But the other hand, he was telling me, um, folks are being discriminated uh, when they found out, when the information got out, whether they have coronavirus. And there are, in cases, wet, a white paint, throwing on the individual's home's door because they have infected. So I think that this tension we will be seeing, uh, um, especially, um, it's always there, but those type of situations highlights it. Well, uh, I don't think I have any deep thoughts broadly on this, but we've, we've done a couple of translations um, as part of the DigiChina project on from the Chinese authorities on how to deal with data around the coronavirus. And um, it's sort of a, um, it's a mixed bag. Um, you, see the, you see the Chinese authorities pushing to uh, essentially make sure that people who are getting into the personal data collection and processing game, new apps, uh, new bureaucracies, um, are being reminded, hey, we have rules about this. You better follow them. So, you know, the, it's just reemphasizing um, existing rules. And then there are also some elements, uh, on the other hand, where uh, authorities are encouraging um, you know, what they call big data uh, techniques and big data you know, services to get into the game of trying to uh, engage in what they call epidemic uh, prevention and control. Um, you know, there, there's a recognized trade-off between the need to uh, bring new tools to bear on this new problem um, and the potential for downsides. They specifically call out uh, preventing discrimination. They specifically call out preventing discrimination against people who are all from a particular location. Uh, they specifically talk about purpose limitation, which is a, a very common concept in data protection 
which says uh, if you collect this data for the purpose of uh, preventing the spread of this virus, you may not use it for anything else. Um, on the other hand, we know uh, from reality in China that uh, the state is uh, escalating the types of data that are collected um, and companies are escalating the types of data that are collected. And since, let's say, 2012 or so, every time I've seen the escalation of uh, a surveillance uh, capability in China, I haven't seen it come back. Uh, you know, 10 years ago uh, and 15 years ago, we used to see uh, surveillance and censorship controls in China would ratchet up around sensitive anniversaries and, and major political events, and then they'd kind of chill out. They don't chill out anymore. And I think there's a, a serious concern now. I mean, uh, there's a great New York Times report uh, from a few days ago about a, a service put together by the Alibaba uh, Financial Services Affiliate um, and the government of Zhejiang province uh, who are issuing color-coded uh, health status uh, you know, readouts uh, in an app for each individual. And if you're in Hangzhou where Alibaba is headquartered, you've got to show your app uh, before you get on mass transit. And what if they got it wrong? And now you can't move through society. I mean, there, there are very thin uh, ways to appeal here. And, and I think that type of closer, more intimate uh, government control that has this veneer of legitimacy because of serious public interests, um, it may not ratchet back in China. And I think in, in democracies and in other countries uh, where there's a greater ability to, to supervise that type of thing, I think we ought, ought to be really conscious of the, uh, of the risk of you know, ratcheting forward on data collection and, and all the risks that are entailed with uh, you know, compiling a bunch of data about our personal health and our, our links to each other. So, Schumann, you are going to have the last word before we open it up for Q&A. You can either answer this question about coronavirus or you can leave us with something that you either really want to drive home as a point or you didn't have the opportunity to say yet but wanted to. The floor is yours. Uh, I, I was actually thinking about uh, Alibaba and uh, coronavirus and, um, you know, there's uh, another technology that Alibaba has developed at the same time, which is uh, machine learning uh, technology that allows them to be able to identify um, coronavirus with 96% accuracy reportedly from a CT scan. So there's often this tension between privacy and security. And this sort of scenario where the entire world is basically focused on this problem right now raises new questions. So for example, if Alibaba has this technology and let's say that they've got a better version of this technology than anyone else, should we take CT scans from around the world and just immediately send them to Alibaba so that their algorithms can get better? Or should we immediately compel Alibaba to share all technology that they have in this area with the rest of the world? Or should we take all CT scans of everyone who is tested positive for uh, COVID-19 and make them public so that the entire world can start to develop better technology and machine learning models? That, that there's not a clear-cut answer here, and different reasonable people would probably disagree on what should be done in this instance. But you know, this is part of the, the tension. And I think that one of the difficulties that we have is that we can't identify those questions well in advance when it comes to new technologies and new scenarios. We only come up with those questions often later. Yes, and so on that note, we'll now open it up for Q&A. Um, when asking a question, please briefly introduce yourself, uh, and there'll be time for commentary after the session, so please ask questions. Uh, and my colleague, Rexel, is there with the microphone. Hi, I'm Matt Brazil. I'm from the Jamestown Foundation in Washington. Um, last year in February, you may have heard about the Chinese company called SenseNets that makes uh, artificial intelligence technology that they um, have sold to the Ministry of Public Security. It's used to track Uyghur people in Xinjiang um, using photos and, and so on. Um, more recently, we've heard about Clear AI, the company that was written about in January by the New York Times, 
their uh, headline was the secretive company that might end privacy as we know it, um, which scrapes the internet for photos and identifies people just from a picture on your, that you take on your phone. So I'm wondering um, if you understand about these two companies, I wonder if you can compare and contrast what they're doing. Are they, uh, clear AI seems to be rather uh, uh, narrow in its purpose compared to SenseNets, which is, is a, using use a broader system. I wonder if you can compare and contrast these two uh, efforts. So um, basically the answer is no, because I don't know the details of these particular companies. I thought that we were dealing with sense time when it was the, uh, the Uyghur Xinjiang uh, nexus, because they're on the list of the folks who've been uh, uh, specified as uh, prohibited for U.S. entities to export certain technologies to without a license. Um, and there was a set of companies that were named by the U.S. government uh, to, as being uh, included in, or in, involved in the uh, uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang and, and uh, enabling those abuses. Um, I think, you know, just to be quick about it, uh, one comment is that facial recognition is no longer a hard problem. Um, <laughs> I'm not much of a programmer. Uh, I spent some time on a Coursera course, and by the end of it, I could build a bad, inefficient, not very powerful facial recognition uh, system. If you get together a bunch of pretty good engineers and you get the data that you need, it's just not that tough anymore. I mean, it's accuracy is hard and you know, perfecting it and speed and handling all the queries and there's a bunch of um, smart computer science and engineering stuff to do. But um, I think that the question for the world is how to deal with the fact that this capability is no longer hard. You know, we assume the NSA and CIA and folks like that have been able to do this for a while. Um, now, a company that you didn't know about three months ago um, turns out to probably have dozens and dozens of pictures of me personally, um, and you know, revealing who knows what I was saying or doing or standing or standing with. So I, um, I think that that uh, it's become a kind of general use technology, and and how to think about uh, that as an ethical and governance and security and human rights problem uh, is the real challenge at this point, but. I certainly, um, the use of facial recognition technology to identify and target people for uh, reasons of their ethnicity or membership in an ethnic group or their associations with somebody uh, and then to throw them into camps uh, is an obvious example of things that we would like to stop. <laughs> so I don't want to imply in any way that that's not um, to be targeted. Okay, we're, we have time for... Maybe just one more question, actually, over there. Hi, uh, Sean Randall, the Barry Economic Institute. Um, could you say something, maybe everybody, uh, on the theme of uh, digital sovereignty? So uh, how legitimate do you think that concept is? Uh, or to what extent do you all think that it, it's more a disguised form of, of digital protectionism? And, and the flip side of the question is if we assume that relatively free cross-border flows of data, especially commercial data, is important to businesses. Um, so wh where does the balance lie right now between countries that are sort of actively pursuing digital sovereignty versus those, as reflected, say, in U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, that are actually trying to protect the free flow of data across borders? Okay. Everyone on the panel will try to answer this, and they'll try to answer it quickly so we can wrap up. Um, I think data sovereignty, that's a, a legit issue, but the point is that don't, you cannot use that as a reason for uh, um, protectionism. I think that's, you know, there is a you know, danger of splinter net. You know, the whole point of internet is a free flow of data is, is, is one internet. Now, if we end up with the splinter net or uh, walled gardens, that's the scenario that we do not want to see. Um. When I think about cyber say, cyberspace sovereignty or uh, digital sovereignty, um, I think it's been the it's a debate about it. A few separate things. Obviously, the whole time, nation states have had legal sovereignty over networks operating in their 
countries. This is just not controversial. Um, but, uh, you know, beginning with J.P. Barlow and the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, um, which was rousing and inspiring and not going to happen. I, for those who haven't read it, he basically says, you states, you don't operate here and we're free uh, from your rule sets. Well, uh, later, uh, there was a debate between internationally between uh, U.S. representatives and Chinese representatives. And the, and the Chinese line was, um, <laughs> this was from Liu Wei, the first head of the Cyberspace Administration of China. He would always say, um, cyberspace is not a place beyond the rule of law. Well, that sounds about right, too. Um, if, you can, if you have leverage over the networks or the individuals operating on them, you've got legal jurisdiction. On the U.S. side, they were saying freedom of speech and association are universal human rights, and they need to be respected throughout networks everywhere. Um, I think that tension between freedoms and state jurisdiction um, has been there the whole time. Um, and I'm not really commenting on the trade thing because that's not my area, but the, you know, I think we're back to that. I, I think now it's clear that uh, states are trying to do various things, and they ought to be judged for their merits, whether it's uh, you know, compatibility with human rights or uh, international security or uh, for, for those who value uh, free trade as a fundamental value for, for free trade or for whatever your values are. I mean, just compare the actual practice of sovereignty. But I, I think it's, uh, it's hard to argue that there is no sovereignty given that the networks exist in, in a physical instantiation. I think that uh, there's no uh, absolutism to this. I think that um, there is uh, no uh, way to be able to argue that governments would be able to have absolute control over what's going on on the internet in uh, their region. There's no way to be able to argue that uh, corporations actually have absolute control over what happens internationally or that everything on the internet is ultimately um, uncontrollable. I think that uh, governments can have a huge impact in terms of what happens within their country. They can uh, make a big difference in terms of being able to create and enforce laws. It doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't digital mechanisms to be able to get around those in some cases, but you can affect what happens in the vast majority of instances. And that is probably what you're going for in the first place. Same thing with uh, uh, corporations behaving in certain ways and creating certain types of product functionality. Well, one of the things that you know I discovered over my career is that uh, it's very much about what defaults you build into platforms. So there may be other options. There may be ways to customize computers to be able to change your platforms and have individuals change their experience with a given platform or with uh, uh, a given uh, type of data. But if you can change what the vast majority of people experience, then that's the majority of the impact that you're hoping to have. And so I think that the internet, of course, is designed to be decentralized and designed to be difficult uh, to control, but there are various ways of being able to change what the default experience is. So, you know, what browser you use makes a big difference in terms of your internet experience, what your primary sources of news are, and, uh, you know, certainly what country you live in. And on that note, um, from discussing data governance to limitations of data flows, potential solutions, tensions between privacy and security, and a phenomenal final question, please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for a, a very interesting discussion. And thank you for joining Asia Society Northern California. And on that note, uh, our reservation of this room is going to run out soon. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you at future events. <laughs>